All right, hello everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? All right, my name is Saad Ali. I am one of the co-leads of SIG Storage. I work at Google mostly on the storage system for Kubernetes. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces here. Patrick back there. Uh, I see Sergey, who's helped a lot with the CSI stuff. And we've got a panel of folks up here that we'll pull up uh, after the presentation to answer some of your questions. Uh, by a show of hands, how many of you are completely new to the storage SIG? Awesome. All right. So you're in the right place. Uh, let's get started. Let's see if I can get my presentation. A little technical difficulty. Oh, there we go. Um, so on the agenda today, we're going to talk about uh, who the storage SIG is, who are the folks that make up the storage SIG, uh, what it is that we do, uh, what we've been working on, um, and how you can get involved. And then finally, we'll close it off with a panel discussion. We'll bring up some of the folks who've been involved with the storage SIG deeply for a long time and uh, have them answer some questions from you. All right, so first up, who is uh, the storage SIG? The storage SIG is a group of contributors uh, to Kubernetes who specialize in the storage volume subsystem. Um, specifically, we're responsible for ensuring that file and block storage is available uh, in a container regardless of where that container is scheduled. We're responsible for provisioning that volume. We're responsible for attaching and mounting it. And then, of course, unmounting it, detaching it, and then deleting it. That's basically the core of what uh, the volume subsystem is responsible for. Beyond that, we're also responsible for influencing the workload. So where the pods are actually scheduled based on storage. So if you're pod has a storage dependency, it's our responsibility to ensure that where it's scheduled, the storage is actually accessible. And finally, we are responsible for storage capacity management. Uh, this includes for persistent volumes, things like volume resizing, and for ephemeral volumes, uh, being able to manage the data that you're, the space that you're using from the underlying host machine. So some notable examples of the features that are owned by our SIG include persistent volume, persistent volume claims. So if these are API objects in, the, in Kubernetes that you've heard of, our team is responsible for that. And if you're interested in helping, uh, we are the team uh, that you should be working with. So storage classes and dynamic provisioning uh, are also under our purview. Um, the entire Kubernetes volume plugin system is part of the storage SIG. Um, and now we have a new initiative called the Container Storage in, uh, Interface, which is trying to move the volume plugins out of tree. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, and of course, if you've heard of uh, secret config map or downward API volumes, these are ephemer ephemeral volumes. Uh, they are also a part of the storage SIG. Uh, we've got a lot under, uh, under our control. And if you're interested in helping, the first place to start is the team page for SIG storage. What does SIG mean? That's a very good question. Uh, special interest group. So Kubernetes is a very, very large project. Um, in order to try to, to have some resemblance of uh, being able to understand what's going on, we decided to break uh, Kubernetes into smaller sub-areas, um, special interests, so that folks can focus and work on uh, sub-components uh, of Kubernetes together. And so the storage SIG is responsible for the things that I just mentioned. There are lots of other SIGs. I think we're approaching 40, uh, including SIG node, which is responsible for everything on the node, SIG networking, which is responsible for networking related things, and so on and so forth. So who uh, is part of SIG storage? We have folks from all over the place, a ton of different companies represented. Uh, at our meetings every two weeks, as well as folks who are independent and unaffiliated and just uh, interested in um, you know, working on Kubernetes or storage on their own. So ultimately what we do is write new features, write tests for those features, and fix bugs. That is the core of what we do. Um, how do we get that done? We meet virtually every two weeks. We have a Zoom hangout. Uh, and then we try to meet face to face every now and then. So every one or two quarters, we'll find some locations. One of these companies that I mentioned earlier will probably host. Uh, and it's just a good way to be able to get to know each other and put faces to 
these GitHub IDs. Uh, and uh, it helps us actually close on some of the really large, gnarly design discussions, which are difficult to close on in a one or two hour virtual meeting. Uh, we also help each other and help the community uh, over various channels, including Slack and our Google group. I'll put up links to that in just a minute. Uh, now I want to talk about some of the work that we've been working on. So 1.10 was uh, a very big release for us. This was last quarter. Uh, in particular, we moved the container storage interface to beta. The container storage interface is an attempt to externalize the volume plugin system. The plugin system that Kubernetes has today is very powerful. It allows you to do dynamic provisioning, which is unique across cluster orchestration systems. Um, but the drawbacks are that because the volume plugins are built into the Kubernetes code, it becomes very difficult to actually add new volume plugins. It's painful for us as Kubernetes developers because we have to accept uh, code that we don't have the ability to properly test or maintain. And it requires that the Kubernetes components that we have, like the kubelet or the kube controller manager, basically the permissions that we grant to those components end up being granted to the volume plugins, which is not ideal. And it also means that any bugs in these volume plugins could crash these critical Kubernetes components like the kubelet or kube controller manager. So we'd like to get away from that design. But it's not just beneficial for uh, the, the Kubernetes developers, it's also beneficial for volume plugin developers. Volume plugin developers don't want to be attached to the Kubernetes release cycle. We have releases every three months, they want to release more frequently possibly. Uh, and they don't necessarily want to always open source their code. When they're part of the Kubernetes code base, they're forced to open source it regardless of whether they want to or not. And so CSI is a, an effort to move away from that and externalize the volume plugins. Local storage is uh, another uh, big, big feature that Michelle has been working on, and she can probably talk a little bit more about it uh, during the panel discussion. But at a very high level, uh, when we first started, most of the volume plugins were external remote network attached storage. Um, this is great in Kubernetes because Kubernetes has this idea of pet versus cattle, right? Your workloads can be terminated on any one node and moved somewhere else. And as long as your storage is remote, that storage can move around with your workload. But what we started to realize was that, uh, let me type in my password. What we started to realize that was that there are uh, a set of use cases, um, especially on-prem, where uh, it makes sense to be able to utilize the uh, uh, storage from the local host machine uh, in a persistent manner. And uh, Michelle can probably expand on that more, and she'll have a presentation on that later this week if you're interested in it. Mount propagation is a feature that allows uh, volume mounts that happen inside of the container to be propagated out to uh, the host machine or to another container. This feature moved to beta and it's a dependency for CSI in order to launch volume plugins that are containerized in Kubernetes. This is a required feature. Uh, ephemeral storage uh, request limit API is something that Jingshu worked on. Uh, the idea here is that Volume plugin, or uh, sorry, uh, containers consume disk space from the local host machine. Even if they, they don't have any volumes attached to them, they will consume disk space in the form of the overlay file system inside the container, um, logs, uh, standard in, standard out. Uh, in a bunch of different ways, the containers themselves are generating content that's being pushed down to the host machine's disk. Uh, until this feature, we had no way to be able to put limits on that. That meant if a container was spewing out logs, it could potentially uh, take up all the disk space on your host machine. Now with uh, the ephemeral storage request limit API, you have the ability to set limits on, on that usage. Uh, and then finally, it's a nice little feature uh, that prevents the deletion of PV, PVC, and pod objects out of order. In the past, if you deleted these objects out of order, it could result in wacky things happening in your system. Uh, as Jesse learned, I think, in his first uh, week of playing around with Kubernetes. Um, so now we have controls uh, in place that will prevent you from deleting these objects out of place, uh, in, out of order. So 
So uh, moving forward, uh, we're hoping to drive these features to GA over the next couple quarters. Uh, for CSI, uh, moving the interface as well as trying to figure out how we can move some of these uh, entry volume plugins to CSI. That's going to be a big effort over the next couple quarters. Finishing up uh, local storage uh, as well as block volume support. Another really interesting feature is going to be uh, generic topology aware handling. Uh, the idea here is that volumes are not necessarily equally available throughout the cluster. And an example of this is AWS and GCE persistent disks, AWS EBS, where the volumes are actually zonal. And you could have clusters that are multi-zonal, so they're only available in a subsection of your cluster. Today, we have essentially hacks in place for AWS and GCE to allow these volumes to be uh, scheduled appropriately. But what we're working on is a generic API that will allow any volume plugin to be able to express uh, that it is not equally available throughout the cluster and have either end users or the scheduler be able to influence both where it's scheduled and understand that uh, it is not equally available and schedule the workloads appropriately. Um, so that's a big eff effort that uh, Michelle is working on as well. Uh, and then uh, snapshot and restore API. So as we grow beyond just making storage available, we're looking at the set of uh, storage features that we can abstract away. The idea of Kubernetes is that we try to become the abstraction layer between cluster implementation and the end user. So one of the operations that we're starting to find that is very common is snapshotting and restoring volumes. Uh, and this is something that Xing is working on. Um, and we're going to introduce that in CSI as well as the core Kubernetes API. Beyond the features that we're working on, we're also working on a set of videos to help onboard new contributors. Aaron Boyd has uh, launched this effort. We taped the first intro video to this uh, a couple weeks ago. We're going to have some of the members um, give presentations, record that, and make that available to everyone to help uh, make it easier to onboard. And then finally, I mentioned the face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, we have one scheduled uh, in two weeks in California on May 15 and 16. If you're interested in joining, please either reach out to me or someone in the SIG or take a look at the SIG mailing list uh, for details on how you can do that. Let's see how we're doing on time. OK. So uh, next up is how do you get involved with the storage SIG? Uh, go to the home page. That's the place that you start. It has information uh, about all of this. Uh, next up, start attending the biweekly meetings. Biweekly here means every two weeks, not twice a week. Um, so every two weeks, we hold a meeting at 9 a.m. Pacific time on Zoom. Uh, links at that page. There is an agenda doc also linked on that page. Feel free to add items to it. If there's something that you want to address, if you have a PR that's not getting the attention that it deserves, there's a design that you want to discuss, pretty much anything that you want to bring up, don't hesitate to modify that doc uh, and just add an item to the next meeting. We may or may not get to it. Uh, if we don't get to it, we'll just move it along to the next meeting. Uh, next up, familiarize yourself with the code. Uh, I find it best to just start walking through the main uh, of any program that I'm trying to familiarize myself with. Uh, beyond that, take a look at uh, two big components. One is the volume manager inside Kubelet. And the second is the controllers that exist in Kube, uh, Kube controller manager for storage. Uh, the primary one is the persistent volume controller. Uh, there's a couple others, but that's the one that you should start with. Once uh, you have some idea what's going on, uh, take a look at the bugs. <laughs> we have a lot of bugs. So as of last month, we had 238 bugs against our uh, SIG. We need help fixing bugs all the time. And more than that, we need help writing tests. We have a huge, huge surface that we expose. And uh, of utmost importance to us is making sure that we don't introduce regressions. We have to realize that the features that we're developing are being used uh, by enterprise companies, by folks that are running you know, healthcare software and all sorts of important things on there. Uh, and data is probably the most important aspect of, uh, of a system. You can lose everything else and recover it, but if you, if you lose your data, it's not coming back. So we need uh, this system to be rock solid. And testing is a very, very important part of that. So if you can help write tests, that would be huge.
And then finally, uh, writing the actual features. Once you become comfortable with the code base and you have an understanding of uh, what's going on, if you're interested in helping either uh, write new features that others are uh, leading the design of, or you're interested in designing your own feature, the process is pretty straightforward. We have uh, one Kubernetes release every quarter. At the beginning of the quarter, in our weekly meeting, or in our bi-weekly meeting, we will uh, host a quarterly planning session for the next release. Um, and then we have a spreadsheet where we keep track of the features that the SIG is working on for that quarter. Uh, we spend about two meetings trying to finalize on what uh, we're going to be working on for that quarter and who's going to be working on it. Those planning meetings are a great, great uh, chance for anybody who's interested in jumping in and figuring out uh, where they can help to volunteer for a feature. Uh, and then after that, at every meeting, the first thing that we do is start with uh, going over the spreadsheet and figuring out what the status of the features that we're trying to deliver are. Um, so please take a look at that. And as a reminder, every feature that we work on must have a feature repo issue. This is the way that the Kubernetes larger organization keeps track of the features that are going into Kubernetes. Um, they use this to keep track of things like documentation, uh, release notes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to make sure that uh, the appropriate feature repo issue is opened. Uh, finally, KubeCon EU presentation. So on Friday, we have a series of presentations from folks in the storage SIG. I'm going to be presenting Kubernetes Storage Lingo 101. So if you're wondering what the heck dynamic provisioning is or persistent volume, persistent volume claims, and all these weird words, I'm going to break that down. Uh, then Michelle is going to be talking uh, about local storage with Ian. Uh, and G is going to be discussing the container storage interface. Uh, and we have a presentation by Jing on the policy-based volume snapshot management work that she's been doing. And that's it. If I could get the panel to come on up, we'll do a quick Q&A session. We've got about seven minutes. All right, so first off, we'll uh, start off with introductions. Michelle, can you start? Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Michelle. I'm a software engineer at Google, um, and I also mostly work on the uh, storage SIG. Um, the main features I've been working on lately have been local storage and uh, uh, topology aware scheduling. Hi, I'm Vladimir. I'm not sure if this is on. <laughs> um, I'm from uh, VMware, uh, a cloud native group. Um, I've been working on storage, uh, the storage SIG, for about a year and a half now. Um, Last big involvement was uh, CSI, and probably will continue to be CSI for the next couple quarters. Hi, I'm uh, Xin Yang. I work for Huawei on the OpenSDS project. It's also another uh, open source project under Linux Foundation. I'm also working on CSI, uh, trying to add a snapshot support into CSI, and also move that uh, support entry in Kubernetes. Hi, I'm Humble Charamel. I work for Red Hat. I mainly contribute to Kubernetes on iSCSI and uh, ClusterFS plugins or drivers. So if you have any questions on ClusterFS or iSCSI, I'll be able to help you out. Yeah. All right, so uh, we'll open it up to questions. Uh, so the question is about CSI. Uh, in the transition to CSI, how long are the current volume plugins, the entry volume plugins, going to be supported? Um, so I can take that. Uh, the plan is not to deprecate the existing entry volume plugins. The deprecation policy for the Kubernetes API is very, very strict. Uh, the volume plugins that we have in tree expose uh, API um, objects, uh, and those objects are not going anywhere. What we do plan to do is change the internal business logic and proxy those APIs to CSI. So as far as the end user is concerned, uh, they are not going to notice a difference. <coughs> the only difference is going to be in the actual internal runnings of Kubernetes. We'll just deploy these CSI containers to fulfill the request rather than fulfilling the request in the Kubernetes binaries. Yes? 
What is the current state of volume resizing? You guys want to take that? Yeah, we support a few plugins to do online uh, volume resizing. Uh, I think we have support for Glustrophers uh, and also support for uh, AWS, uh, EBS, and I think GC support the uh, volume resizing and even the Cinder plugin. So few plugins are supported in upstream. Um, no, but I right now, right now it's alpha. It's still yeah, alpha. It's in alpha state, but uh, yeah, it works for at least four to five plugins <coughs> in upstream. So I think there are more plugins uh, getting added uh, in the maybe upcoming releases. And I think beta is planned for uh, one eleven. Yep. Yep. Cool. Next question. Anything you're dying to know about six storage? <laughs> All right. Uh, right here. Yeah, good question. Uh, so the question is about multi-cluster, uh, potentially migrating, sharing data between clusters. Anybody interested in taking that? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, uh, it's a very good question. And um, if you look at it, the cool thing Kubernetes has done is that within a cluster, we have the ability to dynamically provision volumes. And with snapshots, we're going to have, to be, have the ability to be able to pre-populate those volumes with some data. We haven't really addressed the multi-cluster storage story yet. Uh, there's a couple of different uh, interesting areas there. One is migrating data offline, and the second is uh, replication, live replication. Live replication is probably never going to happen. Uh, data migration, on the other hand, is something that we've been looking at. Jesse uh, has been spending a lot of time looking at it. Um, uh, keep an eye out in the next few quarters for interesting solutions there. Most likely the solutions are probably going to be specific to uh, cloud providers or uh, you know, the, the storage, the, the layers above Kubernetes. Uh, I'm not sure there's much that we can do inside the Kubernetes layer for migration. Um, but if you're interested in talking about that, uh, talk to Jesse afterwards. Yes. Good question. Yes. <laughs> uh, Can so you repeat the question? <clears throat> yeah, the question is um, about how to um, provide data gravity um, to reduce network traffic and be able to schedule pods directly to nodes where the data resides. Um, so this can be accomplished by the volume topology work that is currently in development. Um, the main premise there is to be able to take the same way that you can express pod topology today using node affinity and take that over to persistent volumes. Um, and so as of 110, um, it's beta now. And what you can do is specify node affinity on a persistent volume. Uh, what that will tell the scheduler is if a pod is using this persistent volume and the persistent volume has node affinity on it, it's going to schedule your pod to um, the, one of the nodes that satisfies the node affinity. Uh, it's beta in 110. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's uh, part of the work that Shing is doing on snapshots and restores. Uh, currently, we have a snapshot controller that is external. Uh, and um, we're hoping to pull that logic into Kubernetes. And Jing is actually working on the restore component of this. Um, and the idea is going to be that you will be able to either restore uh, a volume in place, meaning you have a PV PVC that exists uh, and essentially will provision a PV, populate it with some data and swap out, uh, uh, swap it out under the covers. Or you can provision a whole new PV, uh, just create a PVC object and say, I want it to be pre-populated using a specific snapshot uh, and, uh, and we'll go ahead and do that for you. Um, Shing or Jing, do you guys want to add anything to that? Um, I think you pretty much covered it, yeah. So yeah, this is like basically create volume from snapshot. Okay. What about if you have data that's outside of the cluster that you're trying to get 
that is more challenging. Uh, <laughs> ultimately, it goes down to back to your specific storage system. Um, you're going to have to see what tools you have available to actually make the data available within your cluster. Um, as far as the snapshot backup and restore capabilities are concerned, they're sp speaking directly to the storage system that's available uh, in that cluster. Jesse? So So, so you are you are you thinking about if you already have a volume that is outside, not controlled by Kubernetes, you want it to be recognized by Kubernetes? Yeah, is that more the idea of if you had, like, for example, a, a database image or some other data um, that instead of maybe having your application downloading it from a source, you would want it to be like programmatic, <coughs> programmatically made uh, or entered into the mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I think one of the main main challenges there is that we don't. There's no such like standard for a snapshotting format. Um, so the way that snapshots work is that the the snapshot source has to be the same volume type as the volume you're trying to create from the snapshot. Right. If if you wanted to combine like two different sources, like go from NFS to a uh, block storage or something, right? You, you, we would, someone needs to develop some sort of like translation layer to be able to translate NFS from, you know, from NFS to file. Any other questions? Please. About Rook. Yeah, so maybe you sure, yeah. So uh, the question here is uh, what is the difference between the problems that Rook is trying to solve and the problems that this storage <laughs> SIG is trying to solve? Uh, my thoughts on that is that the difference is uh, between making storage available and consuming storage. The uh, SIG here, for the most part, except for local storage, is responsible for making sure that regardless of what type of storage you want to use, we can make it available to your workload. So we're about consuming the storage that is already available in your cluster. The Rook project is more about how do you make uh, distributed network attached storage available on your cluster. Um, and uh, it, you know, you've got these software-defined storage systems that exist, Ceph, Gluster, et cetera. Um, Rook is basically trying to take those and make them easy to deploy through Kubernetes. Um, so you could deploy them outside of Kubernetes today. Rook takes it and makes it very easy to deploy on Kubernetes and makes make storage available. So if you're running on-prem, you have you know, um, storage that is available to each one of these host machines. You can run Rook and uh, aggregate all the local storage that's available and make it available as uh, network-attached storage. Yes? <laughs> uh, any uh, s anybody know anything about NFS? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Follow up with us offline. <laughs> any more questions? Don't be shy. Yes. Uh, maybe one. Um, there was a Rexway um, mm -hmm. prominent project for storage. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, the question's about Rexray uh, and how that relates to CSI and kind of what it is. So Rexray was a project uh, that was started by the Dell EMC code uh, team a while ago. In fact, it predated CSI, uh, and the original intention of Rexray was to be similar to um, CSI in a certain way. It was intended to be an interface uh, between arbitrary storage vendors and arbitrary container orchestration systems. Um, CSI uh, came along and took, captured a lot of that functionality. Uh, and so my understanding is that Rexray pivoted uh, and is now um, basically building libraries around CSI. So if you want to build a storage plugin that is CSI compatible, what Rexray does is give you a framework that says just write this bit of code and um, you will be able to create a CSI compatible volume plugin. Uh, and in fact, Vlad uh, used to work on that team, so maybe he can add more color to that. Yeah, and it's, it's um, I mean, 
support for it has kind of slowed down, but I think it's going to ramp up again. Um, and to, the, to that point, the, 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 there's a lot of work toward earlier this year, um, yeah, earlier this year had gone into making it easy to, to build CSI, if you're a uh, CSI um, uh, plug-in developer, a lot went into it to make it easier to, uh, to create CSI plug-in uh, with uh, minimal code. Um, so um, right now the project is, um, it's still going on, still being maintained, but I think uh, there might be some changes coming, so I, I'm, I'm not sure where, where we're heading with it right now. Yes? Uh, uh, great question. <laughs> you know it was coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the question is about flex volume uh, and how it relates to CSI. Uh, so flex volume was a very early attempt by the storage SIG to do out of tree volume plugins. Uh, the big difference with CSI is that it was an exec based model where we had uh, either scripts or binaries that were executed for operations like attach, mount. Uh, and the biggest problem with that approach was that it's actually very difficult to uh, deploy volume plugins because you actually have to have physical access to the machines to be able to copy these files to a very specific directory on the machine. Um, the other big challenge is that uh, for master operations, which includes provisioning volumes and attaching, uh, a lot of clusters don't actually give you access to the master. So if you look at the uh, Google Kubernetes engine, you don't have access to the master to be able to actually copy the file. So Flex didn't really take off. Um, and CSI eventually came along and addressed a lot of those issues. Um, so as far as the SIG is concerned, CSI is going to be where we're going to continue to invest most of our time. That said, we realized that Flex uh, a lot of folks have written production drivers against Flex, and we plan to maintain the Flex API as is going forward, so that if you have Flex volumes, you don't have to worry about it becoming deprecated or anything like that. That said, we're going to try not to expand the API too much further so that we don't have two massive projects to maintain. The idea would be to maintain Flex as is and continue to expand CSI. Sure. Okay. Right. Yeah, also a good question. Um, so the question is, they've started migrating their uh, plugins to CSI. They are coding against the CSI spec version 0 0.2, which was released in February. Is that going to be stable or not? And that's a great question, because we launched 0 0.1 of the CSI spec in December. And when in February we launched 0 0.2, we made a bunch of breaking changes. So any <laughs> volume plugin that was 0 0.1 compatible broke with 0 0.2. Uh, and so the history behind this is that with CSI, once the interface was where we wanted it, we specifically did not want to make it 1.0 because uh, what we realized is that when you actually go and implement these things, you're going to find tons of issues, and we wanted to give ourselves the flexibility to be able to modify it as we go. Um, so we kept it uh, as a 0.x release. Um, so that explains the big change between 0.1 to 0.2. Now, moving forward, uh, we're planning a 0.3 release around the May time frame. Um, I am going to try to minimize the number of uh, breaking changes between 0.2 to 0.3. That said, uh, it's not completely out of the picture. Um, once 1.0 is cut, which I'm hoping is going to be uh, around Q3 time frame, uh, then uh, we have to, to have uh, rock-solid backwards compatibility like Kubernetes. All right, let's see what the time is. We got one minute. Anybody want to get one more question in? Going once, <laughs> going twice. All right, uh, round of applause for the uh, panel. Thank you. Thank you.